Today we are here at the Bauna Society Center in the beautiful highway area of West Virginia with the most memorable Hainapala Gundratana Mahanayaka Thero and we look forward to sharing his life experience with him on secret to a happy and healthy life. Although he is a world-renowned meditation te teacher, we would like to briefly introduce him before we start the discussion today. It is our privilege, happiness and great excitement to introduce the most venerable Hainapala Gundratana Mahanayaka Thero and to spend the time with the venerable today. The most venerable Hainapala Gundratana Mahanayaka Thero is now 96 years old and he has been spreading the Dhamma since 1940s. Most venerable Hainapala Gundratana Mahanayaka Thero is the founder and the president of the West Virginia Meditation Society Retreat Center in the United States of America, which was started in 1985. And this meditation center is one of the 500 unique religious centers named by National Geographic. At the same time, most venerable Dr. Henopala Gunratana Mahanayaka Thero was honored with the title of North America's Chief Congregant. The most venerable Henopala Gunratana Mahanayaka Thero is a world traveler who has traveled to every corner of the world, sharing his knowledge of Theravada Buddhism helping those who are seeking our seeking out mindfulness for any number of reasons to reduce stress to improve physical and psychological well-being to be more effective skillful and kind in relationship at work home and throughout their lives so today most of our questions are based on the secret to a happy and healthy life that we are trying to uh, work with uh, Bhante. So we have a list of questions to help us capture this unique perspective with Bhante today on the advice for a healthy and happy life. I'll start with the first question came from the audience. So moving from Sri Lanka to the West, can you please share some highlights in your incredible journey from rural Sri Lanka to becoming a world-renowned meditation teacher and an author, Bhante. I <clears throat> left Sri Lanka in 1955, January 15th. I lived four years in India, 10 years in Malaysia, and now 55 years in the United States. During my stay in India, I worked with the Dalit. Mahatma Gandhi called them Harijan people. But the Dalit leader, uh, I don't know whether I mentioned this or not, uh, he is uh, Ambedkar, Dr. Ambedkar. He protested against this term called Hari Jana. So he interpreted Hari means God. You can hear there was a movement in India, Sri Lanka called Hari Krishna. That is another name for Krishna or their God. Hari Jana means children of God. So he protested, you are trying to insult us. If we are Harijana, who are you? If we are sons of gods, sons of children, are you not sons of children, or sons of God? You wanted to insult us by saying that we don't have father. We are bastard. That's why you call us Harijana. <coughs> Uh, and therefore, he protested. So he used the word Dalit. Dalit means underprivileged or dukpa, poverty-stricken people. That is exactly their word. 
and still they are. So I worked with them. <coughs> this Ambedkar's life is very interesting. I don't have time to tell much about him. But I want to mention a few highlights uh, in his life. Yes, sir. His father was the toilet cleaner of uh, King Baroda, Baroda Maharaj in Hyderabad. <coughs> and uh, this little boy was not allowed to go to school because of the caste system. And his father asked him to stand outside school building. The school buildings were built with half walls because of this is India, it's a hot country. And he could see the teachers. So this boy stood outside the wall of the school building. There were half walls and listening. One day, the teacher did a sum on the board for the children and uh, explain it. Next day, he asked children to do the sum on the board. None of them could do it. In order to insult these children, the teacher called this boy, his name is Bhima Rao Ambekar. People call him Bhima. So he asked Bhima to come and do the sum. He came in, inside the building, the first time he came to inside the building and did the sum on the board and uh, went back to his place. As soon as he left the, uh, the school building, and went out to his seat outside the school building. All other children got up and threw away all their food parcels. They brought their lunch packages and put them behind the blackboard. And when this boy came and did the sum and went out, these children got up and threw away all their packages of food outside out of the school building because they believed this boy's shadow fell on the food packages and polluted, polluted their package of food. That's how they treated him. So finally this boy went from class to class, school to school like that, sitting outside the school building walls. Finally, he sat for the matriculation examination, which qualified children to go to a university. So this boy passed that with the flying collar. And then his father went to the King Baroda Maharaj and uh, he would not allow into the would not be allowed into the building. So if he himself standing outside has begged the Baroda Maharaj to help this boy to study. Baroda Maharaj was very kind person, generous person. He sent this boy to England. There he studied and got PhD in economics, PhD in law, and PhD in philosophy. So when he, with all these PhDs, as a lawyer, he came back to India, passed a bar exam, went to the court to represent, uh, present a case, represent his uh, client. <clears throat> as soon as he entered the court building, all the lawyers and judges walked out of the building. 
they were so called educated people and still this uh, stigma of caste system was stuck in their mind. And then he could not uh, present any client, represent any client, so he gave up practicing law. That was the time India was struggling to get independence. Mahatma Gandhi, Nehru, Alibar, Patel and so forth, they were fighting for the independence. 1946, they, in anticipation of independence, they formed a committee to write the constitution. In that, the board of writing constitution, Dr. Ambedkar presided. And in Indian constitution, you can see now, almost every page, Dr. Ambedkar's name is quoted. So finally, he married a Brahmin woman. She also was a medical doctor. And then 30 years he researched on religions. He read many religious books, went to various religious places, except Hindu temples. During that time, Muslims invited him to become Muslim. Christians invited him to become Christians. But Ambedkar said, it was the Buddha who brought prestigious and order and respect to India. And therefore, and also Buddhism is the one religion that uh, does not recognize caste system. Buddha talked very much against caste system. And therefore, I want to embrace Buddhism. So in 1956, in May, full moon day, he became a Buddhist in Nagpur with almost one million people. So I was there in India and I myself did not participate in the uh, conversion ceremony, but later on I Three months after he became a Buddhist, he passed away. <laughs> and then I was invited. I was in Santi, and one morning at about three o'clock in very cold winter day, four people came to Santi and uh, asked me to go with them to accept the relics of Ambedkar and the, the, that ceremony in receiving the relics of Ambedkar after cremation. It was eight hours uh, train ride. I went there. It was at least one half a million 500,000 people were there. I have, I stepped, I was crying one step to the stage, and then we heard these 500,000 people in thundering sound says, Babes, Baba Saab, Ambedkar, Diki, Jaya, Hey! <laughs> it's like thunder. In fact, tears came to my eyes. I had never given the five precept to so many people in my life. That was the first and only time I did that. After giving the five precepts, I gave a talk in Hindi, and that was published in local newspapers. Since then, I worked with them for four years, going from place to place, meeting to meeting, meeting, house to house. Also, I worked in a stay in a hospital in Bombay. Inside the hospital, there was a temple. 
I was there and almost every day I was on the road with these people and then sometimes I went to see patients. I taught them Dhamma, taught Pali, taught meditation and went to their houses for Dhamma. Very, very poor people. I did that for four years. It was a touching story. Yeah, it is a very uh, hard friendly yes. story. Yes. And it is uh, unforgettable as yes. it is. Yes. Thank you, Bhante. <coughs> we'll move to the next uh, question uh, area, Bhante. About your daily routine and meditation practices. You have several questions to follow on that. What does your daily routine looks like? And how has it evolved over the years? Could you describe your meditation practices and how they have contributed to your well-being? Okay, that's a good question. You all, I don't know whether I mentioned to you all, I had a photographic memory uh, since uh, from the age of 16 to 20. I did not have money to buy books, I borrow books and I read them in 10 or 15 minutes at the time. The, those who loan books asked me why did, uh, did I return it so quickly. I said I read it. So they said uh, don't lie. I said you ask me any question from any, any book. Everything was in my memory, page numbers, punctuation, the contents, the words, sentence, everything. It is exactly like a photograph. Mm -hmm. And I had this only for four years. At the age of 20, I had sickness. That was caused by chanting sutras for seven days and night. And uh, that made me sick. And I lost my memory. Everything, even I could not recognize alphabet of languages that I learned, Sinhalese, Pali, Sanskrit, Tamil, I studied, but all this I forgot. So my teachers, parents, all, they did everything to regain my memory. None of them worked. So finally I thought I knew Mahasatipatthana Sutta by heart because even before we knew single alphabet, Pali alphabet, we had memorized Pali uh, Sutta because my parents observed the precept, eight precepts on full moon days, new moon days, part moon days, and then recited the Satipatthana Sutta. So that stuck in my mind. Even after I lost all of my memories, I knew meditation from Satipatthana Sutta. Even though I did not understand every word, but I knew that it was meditation. So I started meditating, just focusing my mind on the breath. And I was meditating like that. And slowly and gradually, I began to recognize letters, words, sentences, meanings of these languages I studied. That encouraged me to pursue meditation. Since then I've been meditating, it was 1947, I was 20 years old. Since then I've been meditating and teaching, writing books. So my daily routine uh, is never complete without meditation. So even now, I get up sometimes 2.30 in the morning or 3 and meditate till 4.15 and then after morning rituals, going to the bathroom and so forth. If I join the crowd, I come to meditation hall, 
by 4.30 and went at six, till 6 o'clock. If I don't come to the uh, come to join the other people in meditation hall, I meditate in my room from uh, 4.50 or 5 o'clock till 7 o'clock. That's how I start my day. <clears throat> and at night, before I go to bed, I meditate another hour. Now I'm going to take three months seclusion, starting tomorrow. And I do meditation for at least 10 hours a day, till March 15, 2024. That's my, uh, every, um, my annual seclusion, in addition to during retreats, and we have retreats uh, one every month, and I join people and meditate with them. So meditation has become a very essential, major part of my life. <clears throat> Thank you, Pante. I mean, that gives me not only uh, uh, peace, yes. But that made my life relatively healthy. Yes. Even though I am 96 now, yeah. I still feel learning. I want to study, I want to read, I want to learn something new. Even yesterday I learned something from that little young monk, something in the cell phone. <laughs> also, uh, but we have an. Um, there was a question from our audience: Is that is that the time you uh, start writing your new books during the seclusion period? Or okay, now lately, yes, lately I uh, normally I give uh, talk uh, last many years. Every Saturday I gave a talk. Yeah. Now, there, some of my books are the collection of those lessons and you know, talks I gave. Yeah. Some, uh, I, when I am in seclusion three months, that is the time I uh, have ideas of writing. So I have notebooks. Yes. Uh, with me and I write whatever ideas come to my mind and write them there. Then eventually I collect all of them and edit and turn into a book. <clears throat> so these two ways I write. Sometimes when I walk, I have my cell phone. Uh, sometimes people ask me questions on my, uh, when I walk on the phone. So some of these questions are related to Dharma. I record these uh, answers uh, and then eventually put them into writing. So these three ways, while yes, I'm walking, yes. while my sec during my seclusion, mm -hmm. and also weekly talks that I deliver uh, on Saturday. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, the next day there is a longevity and good health. Uh, several questions. At 96 years old, you are incredibly healthy and vibrant. Touch wood. What are some of the key practices in your daily routine that have contributed to your longevity? How do you maintain good health at the age of 96? You gave us some examples, but... Yeah. Yes, one is my regular exercise. Yes. Exercise means after breakfast, yeah. I walk at least for one hour. Mm -hmm. After lunch, I walk another hour. That I do every day. Yes. In fact, uh, I have been walking all my life. Sometimes five miles, sometimes six, seven. I remember walking eight miles. I remember walking in Copenhagen in Denmark from morning eight o'clock till 10.30 in the evening. 
my connecting train was at 11 o'clock at night. I came from a Scandinavian country to Copenhagen by 6 o'clock in the morning. And from 6 o'clock to 11 o'clock at night, I had plenty of time. I walked. Like that, I, I like to walk, climb mountains. The one mountain I climbed was Mount Kinabalu in Malaysia, 14,000 feet. Another is Mount, uh, another, uh, El Paso uh, and Bolivia and so forth. Whenever I saw a mountain, I want to climb it, and I walk. Now, even now, I uh, walk a little bit. Uh, that is one thing I do. Second thing, I eat little uh, vegetarian food, and I meditate. And also, I don't get angry. That is uh, another very important segment in my life. I don't like to get angry. And I sleep uh, regularly. Uh, I go to bed later at 9 o'clock and get up at 3 o'clock. So that my sleep is regular, eating is regular. Exercise is regular, meditation is regular. Everything uh, I do regularly, uh, and therefore, uh, I think I'm okay now. Yeah, great, great. great. So, um, so while you are exploring the, the especially the uh, European part of the world. Uh, have you been interested of seeing other religious, uh, knowing Christianity, Catholicism, yes, Judaism? In 1984, yeah. I had an invitation to participate in midnight service in Vatican. Right. Uh, then I I was in Europe leading from retreats. Then I went to Vatican. But my plane was late, so I could not participate in that. But, but other times I went to Vatican and spent the entire day uh, seeing, uh, you know, main uh, shrine yes. with uh, Michelangelo's uh, pictures and so forth. And I have participated in uh, many interfaith religious uh, organizations, religious uh, meetings, and once there was uh, an organization called Temple of Understanding, yeah. and, and then they invited me to come to uh, Switzerland, and I went there, and also we had a big uh, meeting with the Dalai Lama in uh, uh, 1992 in Chicago. <coughs> I participated mm -hmm. in then. Uh, so interfaith uh, conferences are common yeah. right yeah. now. Thank you. I attended Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, under longevity, are there specific meditation techniques or lifestyle choices? that you believe have contributed to your excellent health? I think my meditation is Samatha Vipassana, uh, Tranquil Meditation and Insight Meditation. Yeah. I advise uh, people who are interested in meditation, these two, Samatha Vipassana, are not two different types of meditations. They are just like uh, two sides of the same coin. You cannot gain uh, concentration without uh, mindfulness, mm. nor can you develop mindfulness without concentration. These two go hand in hand. 
and I tell, I recommend people, and I do that myself. Certain time in the of the day, your concentration is very good. That time, practice concentration. Certain time of the day, your concentration is not good. That time, practice mindfulness. So you are not uh, leaving one out at the expense of the other. So practice both. <coughs> Can you share your insight on the link between meditation and physical health? You touched base on a little bit earlier. How has meditation specifically benefited your physical well-being? I think meditation makes your mind yeah. calm, relaxed, and peaceful. Mm -hmm. Your uh, nervous system becomes very smooth, and then your uh, hormones, uh, chemistry, generate very healthy chemistry that circulates all over the body through the blood circulation. Yes. Mind, when the mind is calm, relaxed and peaceful, you are not agitated, not excited, and not for building tension, anxiety, worry, fear. These are the fear, tension, worry, anxiety, these are uh, causes of some mental diseases and physical uh, illness. But if they are very smooth, uh, your nervous system smooth, uh, it's relaxing, uh, and then the hormone generating in the brain will be a healthy hormone and that helps to build up your uh, increase your health. For instance, you will not have uh, uh, pressure, blood pressure, it goes down and uh, your cholesterol may not, bad cholesterol may not be it may not be increasing. Uh, so you feel mentally healthy and physically healthy, and uh, you will have a quality life. Quality life is coming from quality mind, healthy mind. It is the mind that makes the body sick, not the body made the mind sick. And therefore, when the bodily, even when bodily sickness is there, you can deal only with that instead of letting it invade the mind and affecting the mind. So these two we can keep uh, uh, together at the same time, helping each other when we meditate. Thank you, Mante. The last question in the longevity is, what are your thoughts on the role of stress in aging? We see you are uh, decreasing. I mean, I don't see any stress on you. Um, how do you manage stress in your own life? Uh, I don't have any intention to stretch my life. Okay, sure. I do what I uh, feel like doing. Having uh, uh, regular consistency, the consistency in my practice, in my food, mm. exercise, meditation, and so on. Uh, I keep doing these things, and uh, I have no intention whatsoever to extend my life to increase my ears, no intention. When I do this, they may happen. Right, okay, <laughs> thank you, Vente. Um Next one is uh, vegetarianism. But, uh, we know uh, you've been a vegetarian for a very long time. 
and the couple of question is the the one is um, do you have any dietary or exercise secret that you attribute to your good health can you elaborate on your vegetarian diet and how it impacts your energy level next one is you are known to be a vegetarian I, as i mentioned before how has the dietary choice influenced your life and your approach to meditation okay Actually, I was not a vegetarian long time ago. Was it? Okay. Long time ago, I was not vegetarian. But uh, lately, I uh, realized vegetarian food is healthy. So I began to adopt, I adopted vegetarian lifestyle. That makes me feel comfortable. Uh, and also I uh, heard a lot of uh, uh, animals uh, were uh, given a lot of hormones, various types of things injected to their bodies and their flesh is uh, sometimes poisonous. And also I heard that uh, some people get even cancer when they consume a lot of meat. And these things are, I have no way to prove it, but these are the things that I have heard. Yes. So vegetarian diets is uh, easy, healthy, uh, easy to digest. Uh, you don't feel the guilty of uh, participation of killing. Although we don't do that, but uh, uh, inadvertently, indirectly, we might uh, participate in killing if we continue to eat meat. Uh, for the uh, for the conscience remains clean uh, if we don't meditate. And when you meditate and practice metta without hesitation. You can send metta to all living beings. Otherwise, uh, you feel you are hypocritical. Uh, for this reason, I like to maintain vegetarian diet. Occasionally, when we go to certain houses, and if they have uh, prepared something with uh, uh, fish, and meat and so forth, uh, we don't fight with them and we eat. Uh, but we are not uh, uh, particularly insisting on them that uh, they should prepare something very special for us. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. Mate. Yes, uh, the next area is photographic memory. You did mention earlier that you lost the memory uh, for a short period, and then Mahasati Patani and the blessing of your parent uh, enable you to regain. Uh, the, the couple of questions here, many people are fascinated by your photographic memory. How do you believe meditation has played a role enhancing or maintaining this ability? Okay, now I don't have photographic memory. But I still can remember many discourses in Pali. Uh, not uh, everything I remember verbatim, but uh, the contents of many, many suttas I still remember. The reason why I remember them is I, I repeat. I repeat in my talk, I repeat and when I'm alone, uh, when I walk, I listen to these discourses since uh, thanks to this latest technology, uh, we use uh, uh, my cell phone and many hundreds of discourses are there, we can download and uh, I can listen to them without disturbing anybody using Bluetooth. <laughs> so, and therefore, yeah. 
I can uh, remember that. So, uh, yeah. yeah. But the, um, our audience is trying to find more about your memory uh, capability. Are there specific mindfulness or memory exercises you recommend for cultivating mental clarity? Actually, keep in the mind simple, life simple, and uh, uh, it's very important key practice. Uh, if we, if we, the mind is cluttered with all kind of uh, defilements, countless activities, being busy all the time, you tend to forget things. If you simplify your life, uh, and then simplifying life is one thing, and repeating the same thing again and again is absolutely necessary to remember things. When you look at discourses, Buddha's discourses, in discourses you can see repetition. The same thing would be repeated many times in the same discourse. The reason is, those days they did not have books, uh, no writing facilities, they just sat next to the teacher and listened very carefully. And when the teacher repeats the same thing several times, the student can remember it. In uh, Pali text, they can say this repetition. Uh, so, one thing is making the life simple, uh, keep a meditation every day, many times a day, and reading discourses. After reading them or listening to them, you repeat them. And these are the four steps you have to follow in order to remember things. Simplifying life and meditation, listening or reading and repeating. If you don't repeat anything, it becomes sort of uh, rusty. And Buddha said, asajjaya mala manta manta mala gara. Malam one is supposed to be a pamadu rakatu malam. Malay means uh, rust. When what you learn is not repeated again and again, it, it uh, gets rusty. Then it takes long time to remove the rust. Similarly, when you don't repeat the Dhamma sutras again and again, we tend to lost. We tend to lose. Yes, yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. You are known for your incredible memory, same subject. Can you share some of the technique you have to uh, remember information so vividly? I think we, we got answer for that. What role do you believe meditation plays in enhancing memory and cognitive functions? <clears throat> I believe in that from my own personal experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I think many people at my age uh, tend to forget a uh, lot of things, especially the short-term memory. Mm -hmm. It's a very common thing people forget uh, uh, things very quickly. So, uh, I mm, my, sharp, my memory is not as sharp as before, but relatively the memory relative to other people of my age. Uh, I think I remember certain things better than them. I attribute this to my meditation. And also I don't get upset, I don't get angry, uh, I don't try to confuse my mind. Uh, I don't 
get involved in all kind of other yeah. things. And also, of course, uh, even now, in spite of all these things, uh, when I'm tired, I forget. Yes. So, I remember certain monks <coughs> at the age of 60, they gave up giving Dhamma talks mm-hmm. because they don't remember Dhamma facts, the suttas. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I still give Dhamma talks. Uh, not uh, everything I remember that like it depends, but I still can give the motto because I can put my facts together yes. uh, to make people understand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Bhakti. Uh, do you have any advice for people who are struggling with memory loss or cognitive decline? I think you did explain us four steps, yeah. right? Uh, is there anything else to add to that, Bhakti? Uh, simple life through repeating the uh, disclosures. You know, uh, you have to trust yes. the Buddha, yeah. Dhamma, Sangha. Yes. And you also have to uh, personalize the Buddha's teaching. Okay. Just like in uh, uh, Dhamma quality, we say, uh, Dhamma Dhamma says, come and see. That means we have to internalize what we read in text. We we, we uh, accept them. For instance, while I am talking to someone, about uh, impermanence, about anger, about lust, uh, about jealousy. I must look inside myself while I'm telling them, don't become jealous. I must see it within myself. Do I have jealousy? Am I jealous? Uh, How it works? how it makes me uncomfortable uh, when I say, don't get angry, while telling them not to get angry, I must look at myself and see when I get angry, how I feel. So, the Dhamma is within us. We say we pay respect to the Dhamma, not Dhamma that exists outside hanging from clouds in somewhere. That Dhamma we talk about is within us. We say, when you get angry, you feel uncomfortable. When you don't get angry, you feel comfortable. When you are very greedy, you feel very very uncomfortable. Uh, When you are rigid with ego, you feel rigid and uncomfortable. So these things, I see it in myself and therefore, I like to remove them from my heart, my mind, and uh, then I, from that experience I can tell people. Uh, when I practice metta, I feel so comfortable, so peaceful, so happy, so friendly. From that experience I can tell people, do practice metta. Like that, from my personal experience, I learn Dhamma. And Buddha said exactly the same thing. Dhamma is in us, not anywhere else. Dhamma is, every part of Dhamma is in us. For instance, suffering. I talk about suffering. Where is that? Within you. Suffering is with me. Cause of suffering, desire, is in me. End of suffering, anibbana. In me, the path leads into the end of suffering. Noble death for God. Every step is in me. I have to practice it. And therefore, from my experience, I can talk to people. Mm. Uh, So, uh, this is how I incorporate Dhamma into my life. Thank you, Bhakti. 
we are moving from there to teaching philosophy. Um, what is your philosophy when it comes to teaching meditation and how has it evolved over the years? How do you tailor your teaching to individuals from different backgrounds and cultures? Okay, that's a little complicated question. Yes, sir. When somebody comes to me to learn meditation, I must first understand how much meditation he has done, whether he is total beginner or he has some experience. Some people go to various meditation teachers and they come and tell me that I learn meditation from so and so, and so and so says such and such, and so forth. Then I have to clear this background first uh, and should point out uh, the mistake, uh, the wrong information they got from various places various, uh, you know, different people teach according to their understanding. That is the normal thing. I teach according to my understanding, so you teach according to your understanding. So uh, that's what you see in uh, uh, lower samaro, tamma tamma nana paman in dada gata yutu. We learn things according to our own understanding. So, when they come, I ask, I ask them questions. And then after the, when they answer, depending on their answers, I explain the Dhamma. If they have gone wrong, I correct them. If they have done rightly, I say it is right. Yes. Uh, it's correct. Um, then I point out that you cannot meditate without having at least some basic understanding of Dhamma. For instance, when you're going to practice, if somebody is talking about, I cannot gain concentration, I cannot gain concentration, this is the main complaint. Many meditators come to, come to me and say, I cannot concentrate, I cannot concentrate. Some meditators say, meditators say, as soon as I sit to meditate, I gain concentration very quickly. Now, those who say I gain concentration very quickly, actually what they, uh, what they experience is as soon as they sit to meditate, they fall asleep. They sleep very well for about half an hour or one hour and then get up and say, Oh, I had wonderful meditation. I attained the fourth jhana. What they really have done is they slept very well. Yes. And others uh, say who oh, cannot gain concentration. As soon as they come to meditate, they sit on the cushion and then they, they think of uh, their jobs, their wives, their children, their house, their telephone call, the letters they have to write job they had to do, um, the money in the bank, how much interest they get, how much they invest, where they invest, which gives you more interest. These are things they think. Yeah. And then say, I can do it concentrate. How can they concentrate? So, so we have to clear out all these things. Yes, sir. Yes. What do, we have, what do you do in meditation? Oh, I sit and I focus my mind on the breath, and then I think of, uh, all ideas and so forth, I cannot. Then we have to clear. Yeah. And then next thing I must tell them is that when you sit to meditate, you take a, you breathe very slowly, breathe in. Slowly breathe out. Slowly breathe in. Slowly breathe out. Taking long inhaling, long exhaling. That gives you time to become aware of your body, feeling, perception, thought, and consciousness. And then while you are breathing in, you experience your body changing, your feelings changing, 
your perception changing, your thought changing, your consciousness changing. What does it mean when we are breathing in all five aggregates? Form, feeling, perception, thought and consciousness, not the five aggregates. They change while we are breathing. They also change. They do not stay for one fraction of the second the same. They change, 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 change. Once they begin to realize this, understand this, then they gradually fall into the trap, in, into the trap, into the trap of meditation. So that's how it is. Yes, yeah. yeah, great. Yes, so that's a great segue to our last uh, couple of questions on meditation to wrap it up. Uh, the meditation subject. In your extensive experience, what transformation have you observed in individuals who have adopted regular meditation practices? You gave us, you know, people are able to sleep and um, uh, etc. So you know that this is uh, the, the center provides extensive kind of from beginners to the uh, some level of uh, meditation skills, uh, various levels. Um, what have you been observing? Um, have you been observing or associating or getting any feedback from them to say, from the day one through now in the last 10 years, this is my change? I think that's what we are looking for. You know, first thing I hear from people, after years of practice, they say one thing. Yes. You really changed my life. Okay, great. And now I am living a totally different person. Okay. I am no longer doing so and so. Mm -hmm. as, as in the past. I then they ask me how do they know whether they make progress or not. Very simple. You just look at yourself and ask yourself how many times a day you got angry ten years ago. And how many times you get angry now? You can come back. Right. Now your frequency of getting angry is very low, mm -hmm. not quick. Yes. You don't get don't get angry quickly. Yes. Perhaps you don't get angry uh, certain days you don't get don't get angry at all. In the past you are so greedy for everything. Now you are you are less greedy. In the past you were very jealous. Now your jealousy is minimized. And in the past you want to you want to take revenge. Now it is completely gone from your mind. Mm -hmm. So you can assess your own progress right. from your own experience introspectively you watch yourself. Yes. And then you can see how much progress you have made. There is no progress in you know, any statistics. Yes. Uh, you have to Compare yourself today, yeah. today's life, uh, ten years it's down the road. Thank you, Rante. Uh, we are moving from there to life in uh, this beautiful Highview, uh, West Virginia area. How did you decide to settle in Highview, West Virginia? I believe this came from someone who had read your books. Uh, and what prompted you to build a meditation center here? Second question is, what inspired the concept of providing free food and shelter to those in need? I think that's also a good question. Yes. When you build a meditation center, it has to be away from very busy cities. Yes. And secondly, I was uh, 
looking for a place less expensive, land is less expensive. Uh, third, there are not too many other religious Buddhist temples. Yes. Uh, if if I build meditation center close to, or, or, for instance, Washington Buddhist Vihara, yeah. then there may be some misunderstanding among people that I built just to attack the other temple right, and to get their supporters and make go them go them out of business. Right. Yeah. You know, that kind yes. of misunderstanding. Yes. In order to avoid that, I selected this great. The the second part of the question, what yeah. is? The second part of the question, uh, Mante, is what inspired the concept of providing free food and shelter to oh. those in need? I think that was a very good. Yes. Uh, at the beginning of this center, many of my friends who have heard that I was going to start a meditation center, they asked me, how much do you charge? Especially in the United States, very seldom, you know, almost nothing can you get free. If you give something free, People don't appreciate it, it's just cheap, they just give. And therefore they have to charge. Secondly, they have to they have they have to rent places, so they have to charge. Uh, thirdly, also they have to live. They have to get some money. They have to, therefore they have to charge. When I started this place, uh, I thought I want to follow may Buddha's main teaching. That means uh, I have heard when I go to, the, go to various places, they ask for donation for this, for this, for that. So people are tired of going to those places. They think he cannot, we don't want to go there. Every time I go there, they ask, donate this much, donation for this, this, this. You know. And also Buddha said in Vinaya, because don't ask any, ask people to give you anything. If you ask people to give anything, they will run away from you. And he gave a very beautiful example. Uh, there were certain monks meditating in a forest and they could not meditate because birds, birds coming and making a lot of noise. So they came and complained to the Buddha. The Buddha said, okay, you ask these birds every day, please, Give me a feather. Again, I please give me a feather. Give me a feather. These birds were so tired, they ran away. <laughs> Similarly, if you ask people to give me this, give me that, yes. they will not come back to you. Yes, okay. And so, that's one thing. So then I said to these people, therefore we don't charge. Then they asked me, do you accept donation? We accept donation. What is your suggested donation? I said, if we suggest a donation, it is no longer a donation. It is fixing the price indirectly. You tell, yes, the price is this one. You but you don't tell them directly 
it is this, but indirectly you say, say price is this. So there's no difference. Donation is something that must come from their heart. Yes, sir. When they have something, they mm -hmm. give it. Yes. Donation is not item number one in their priority list. Yes, sir. Donation is something, mm -hmm. last item in a priority list. Yes. Okay. Next thing is, when people come to meditation, yes. sometimes there are problems in the house, divorce problem, and there are property problems, they have lost their job, they don't have money, they need some kind of peace to have some peaceful mind. Yes. So with all these problems when they come to us, even when they, when they come to us, we also ask for donation, they get very, very upset. Yes. You know, sometimes people have come here, there are some cases, I know, suicidal. They need really some help. Yes. When they come here, if we ask for donation, is it? it is just like uh, putting from frying to, to, to the fire. fire. Yeah, yeah. And therefore, we thought we don't charge, we don't have any solicited donation. Yes. Donation is unsolicited. Yes. That's and right. Therefore, whenever somebody comes here, they feel Yes. Very comfortable, mm -hmm. even without one penny. Yeah, we we have retreats. We don't ask for donation. Yes, but some people, if they have money, they put money into the donation box. Yes, some yes. people don't have anything. Right. How can they give? Yes, yes, sure. And therefore, this kind of uh, attitude, yeah, uh, we don't charge. Right. However. We have never run out of money. Right. Never yes. run out of food. So, so. Never run out of people. Yes. We have money. Get money. Yes. People donate. Mm -hmm. We have people. Yes. They come. Sometimes they bring cooked food. Sometimes with the grocery yes. solutions. And uh, we are good. And yeah. also we don't have. <coughs> Now we we don't uh, uh, owe one penny to anything. Yes. No debts. Yes. To bank, no mortgage, nothing. Yes. Everything is completely free. Fifty acres of land. All this, you know, I believe very strongly that if you start something with clean heart, good conscience you will always be successful. Yes. Good Especially in a spiritual field, yes. a spiritual life. Mm -hmm. I think that is a very important message that we want to send out. Of course, everybody cannot do that because they have their own other commitments. Yes. But uh, if we really start doing something like this, Donation comes, people come. Yes. They're thirsty of learning Dharma, mm -hmm. and they come. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. So, um, before we wrap up, we, uh, there are several questions on the advice for happy life, secret to a happy and healthy life. Uh, so, the audience is aware that you have been helping those who are seeking out mindfulness for any number of reasons to reduce stress, to improve physical and psychological well-being, to be more effective, skillful and kind in relationship at work, at home, etc. Right. So the uh, first question on that is uh, what advice would you give to people seeking a happy and fulfilling life? I think uh, the first of all you must relax and teach others with relaxed state of mind. Secondly, practice metta. 
loving friendliness and try to feel the feeling of other people. When we try to teach, when we teach, we should not uh, 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 teach in a confusing way. We have to teach, we have to understand what we are going to teach, digest the material, and teach it in a very simple way so that people can understand. Mm -hmm. You know, when we try to uh, uh, teach somebody, if we use the insulting words, then they will get offended. Uh, you may have a very good intention. Good intention itself is not enough. You have to have a means to express good intention. That means, what's the means? Your words. Yes. Words must be very gentle, polite, friendly, sincere. Gentle, friendly, polite, polite, polite and sincere. sincere. With this, you can teach. Sometimes people point out other people's weaknesses in public mm. while they are teaching. They give, I know certain individuals, people wash their feet and bring them on the clean clothes, make them sit, bow down, and then they start teaching. They Quote Buddha's uh, teaching as the, the subject. I'm going to talk to you about uh, uh, making effort and so yeah. forth. Uh, beautiful stanzas. They will recite at the, as a topic. And then straight away they start attacking people, individuals. Hey, your life is well, so you will do such and such a wrong thing. You know, attacking them personally. There's a beautiful discourse in Mahatmya called Arana Vibhanga Sutta. Arana Vibhanga Sutta. There Buddha said, how to teach them without insulting people. When you teach Dhamma, you teach Dhamma alone. For instance, when you say greed is harmful. You don't find a person to feed the grief. That means, uh, I know, if you say, for example, I know in such and such a place, there is such and such a person, he has such and so much and so much wealth, and that person does not spend money, he is very stingy and so forth. Instead of saying that, putting the person into the slot, you explain only the Dhamma. That means when you say, greed is painful. When the mind is filled with greed, that mind is not in peace. Now that you teach them only the Dhamma rather than pointing at certain individuals. Are there simple daily practices or attitudes that you believe contribute to overall well-being? You mentioned few of them. I mentioned already. Yes. Uh, you know, daily practice, good healthy food, yes. good uh, exercise, yes. at least walking, sleep in time, and then meditate, don't get angry, and uh, relax. Relax. Uh, practice a lot of patience. These are things we have to do to make life, daily life simple. Yes. Yes. 
Thank you. You have written extensively on mindfulness and clear comprehension. Can you share some of the key insights from your work that contribute to a happy and fulfilling life? I think you mentioned, mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah. What are some of the biggest challenges people face in achieving happiness and well-being? Um, how can meditation help overcome these challenges? Uh, Challenges are, we cannot uh, universalize. Yes. They are personal okay. challenges. Right. So, when the challenges are personal, we have to seek uh, advices of uh, uh, teachers in person. Mm -hmm. So, the teacher would be skillful enough yes. to sort out the correct answer to uh, give to this particular person. Yes. Uh, we cannot uh, talk about universal challenges. Mm -hmm. Individual. Basically. Individual. Yes. Good, good. Thank you. You have dedicated your life to helping others uh, to find peace and happiness. What brings you the most joy and fulfillment in your work or teaching? I think uh, that is If I can <clears throat> explain Dhamma to make somebody understand, that gives me joy. Joy. Yes. 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 And when I explain certain things, and after that, when I think about it, uh, my explanation was not very clear, and the people didn't seem to enjoy it, didn't seem to understand it, then I feel not very happy. Okay. So always I think of explaining things in a way that they understand. Mm -hmm. That is where I have joy. Thank you. As someone who has lived a long and fulfilling life, what are your biggest pieces of advice for people of all ages who are seeking to live a more meaningful life? With a lot of example you gave us, anything left? Okay. I think we have uh, answered all the questions. Yeah. Yeah. Sequences. Yes, questions. Yeah, sure. Good, good. The, uh, we are wrapping up to the last section, legacy and future plans. We are so sure you have a lot of plans. I'll start with number one. As you have approached your 96th birthday, uh, by the way, this question came before your 96th birthday. What legacy do you hope to leave behind? Oh, okay. Actually, I like uh, people after me continue our principles, mm -hmm. our policies, bhavana legacy. That means we serve anybody selflessly. Mm -hmm. We never ask somebody who, what his religion is, uh, what his job is, uh, and so forth, we don't go into all these personal things. We simply teach the Dhamma. And also we don't go out to ask for money. We keep our principle of receiving unsolicited donation. Yes. And we treat whoever comes to this place equally, men, women, homosexual, bisexual, heterosexual, doesn't matter to us, Buddhist, Hindu, Christian, Catholic, Jew, Jew, doesn't matter to us. We treat everyone equally yes. and teach the Dhamma equally. And our friendly attitude towards everybody uh, and 
let them experience peace in this place and go with peace out of this place. When they come here, mm -hmm. they must experience peace. If we have a little, you know, this uh, petty uh, quarrels and arguments and words, harsh words and so forth, that is the impression people get of this place. And then they live with those things in mind. That's not good for this place. In order to maintain the, you know, that's natural geography thing. Yes. I really admire you. I don't know who wrote it. Right. National Geography is there. This is one of the 500 most sacred places in the world. People come to this place like going to going on a pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. Very common. Yeah. You know, yes. People go to go on pilgrimage to holy places. Yes. Going on around the world. Yes. In the India somewhere. Yeah. Like, double in, people in the yeah. whole place of mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. On pilgrimage. Right. Let people come to Bahavana just like they are to open a pilgrimage. Yes. A few people come from New York, mm -hmm. sometimes 40, 45 people who bus load of people come here as they are going to pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. So this place be treated as a sacred place, mm -hmm. not secret place. Yes. <laughs> but sacred place. Yes, yes. Right. Because we represent the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. We are the ones who teach Dhamma. And we are the ones who like to promote peace. And therefore, when they come to this place, they must feel what they teach. That's the good plan. Okay, thank you. Knowing that you are getting younger and stronger, do you have any new project or initiatives in your mind for the future? Actually, we have started some projects uh, and we want to continue them. Like we have started scholarship funds, we want to expand them and we get that means we want to expand. We started is a monthly sugar study in Sri Lanka. We want to expand it. We will we have started training uh, teachers in certain schools. It's we want to continue that. If possible, uh, we want to give a scholarship to every child in Sri Lanka. We can give scholarship to every child in the world. Yes, it was yes. 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 But uh, uh, within our means, yes. we can reach out to help people. Right. Good to know. What are some of your hopes and aspirations for the future of meditation and its impact on humanity? In the three level meditation, also, yeah. I have to say it's the same thing. Yes. That means meditation now yeah. is spreading like wildfire mm -hmm. all over the world. Along with spreading meditation, misunderstanding of meditation also is spreading. Is spreading. And we want to spread not wrong meditation practice, but a right meditation practice. Right meditation practice you find only in the Buddha's teaching, in text. So we have to study text related to meditation, like Mahasatipa Kamsutta, Satipa Kamsutta, Anapana Satipa, Kainata Satipa, Anapalakshan Sutta, Vishwananda Sutta, Yama Sutta, and these are the sutras that we started to teach meditation, to learn meditation and practice meditation. Now, we have to study them and explain them in a very simple language. Of course, in order to explain them, we have to read and we have to understand it and digest it and then we 
cheated. And then that's misunderstanding of me. You know, many meditation uh, teachers sometimes, they simply you know, crack dumb jokes just to make people laugh. Eat you up. Yeah, not with sleep. So people you know, flock to those places to listen to their jokes. Uh, they they call this so, such a wonderful teacher, wonderful preacher, and so forth. What have they learned? Jokes. Yes. That's not what yes. they want to represent. Yes. We want to teach yes. this Dhamma, original Dhamma, serious Dhamma, Dhamma that make sense. Yes. Yes. So, Avante, this is the last question. It came before your 96th uh, birthday. So, we assume you are still 95th. So, what are your reflections on life? Yeah, this question came from before your 96th birthday. Oh, my yes. So, uh, what are your reflections on life, aging, and the pursuit of happiness? I think, yeah, I think we, we touch a lot of things. So, the person who sees the it, person came from different, different direction. Way. Yes. They did not know what other people Yes, know. yes, sure. Yeah, I, I mean, we did um, clean out a lot, but we want to make sure that they hear some of their questions. Right. So it's not, uh, really appreciate your time, Bante. Um, these questions should have provided a comprehensive view of uh, most venerable, venerable Gundratna Thero's experience and insight into his spiritual journey. We worship and thank you, uh, Bante. Uh, for sharing with us your experience. At the same time, we wish you a happy and healthy life one day. And we look forward to sharing life experience with such a discussion in the future. Please follow bhavanasociety.org website to listen to regular Dhamma talks by most venerable uh, Hinnapal Gunratana uh, Theros in addition to uh, YouTube and Facebook uh, transmission. We also extend our heartfelt appreciation to Venerable Dr. Sadaji Vatero, Vice Abbot at the Bauna Society in West Virginia, for his invaluable support in guiding us through the process of hosting a series of discussion and Q&A session. These are the last one for the year and the fourth one, uh, with the most venerable Mahanaya Gatero, uh, who is a world-renowned meditation master and Dr. Sardaji Vatero's esteemed superior at the Meditation Center. Uh, Dr. Sardaji was encouragement, coaching, and insight uh, input played a pivotal role in shaping our conversation and ensuring a meaningful exchange of ideas. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you.